Welcome to The Script Mistress, where we dive into the world of screenwriting. I am your host, Amber Bosworth, and in this episode, I got to interview the writer of the play that I recently performed in my local community theater. I'm very excited about this. Now, to keep yourself informed about podcasts, events, and challenges, please make sure to get on my mailing list at thescriptmistress.com. Additionally, if you're not watching it, you can find this entire episode on video at thescriptmistress.com forward slash scene 550, where you'll also discover a delightful free download waiting for you on that page. I also have this available on the Script Mistress YouTube channel, where you can access all these episodes, and I'll have the link of that in the show notes. So today's podcast features Phil Olson, an accomplished playwright and screenwriter from Edina, Minnesota. A versatile athlete in high school, Phil was a varsity player in football, basketball, and track, and even won the Minnesota State High School track meet in discus. His athletic prowess continued at Dartmouth College, where he excelled in track and football, playing alongside notable teammates like Jeff Amelt and Buddy Tevens. Now, post-college, Phil briefly tried out for the Chicago Bears before earning an MBA from the University of Chicago. Now, shifting his focus to the creative arts, Phil now resides in Los Angeles, where he writes and produces plays. He has penned 19 published plays, including hits like A Twisted Christmas Carol, Birthday Club, and Mom's Gift, which have been performed in multiple countries. Notably, his plays have garnered over 50 awards, and many are set in his home state of Minnesota. In addition to playwriting, Phil has also successfully ventured into screenwriting, and script doctoring, showcasing his diverse talents in the entertainment industry. And I'm so excited because I've actually acted in A Twisted Christmas Carol and just recently Birthday Club. And I, I saw that he really loves how we kind of put on his plays in our local area. He's really an advocate for the Midwest. And you're going to hear all about that in his interview in just a few seconds. But I, I was so excited to kind of just reach out to him. Um, he had commented on one of our posts about the the play going on, and I just decided, hey, you know, why don't I just reach out and see if he would be willing to come on to my podcast? Um, because he's not only a playwright, but he's also a screenwriter where he's adapted some of that in there. So I think you're going to learn a lot, not just on the playwriting, but on the screenwriting as well, and how writing for multiple entertainment kind of genres and industries can actually help you become a more well-rounded screenwriter screenwriter and writer in general. So without further ado, let's hear him talk all about it. Well, thank you so much for, for agreeing to do this. This is awesome. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, well, we just finished, I got it. I got it right here. We, we just finished the birthday club, um, at in Watertown, which was an amazing run. We had so much fun, uh, with it. So I just wanted to like, uh, talk a little bit about birthday club. What was, I know some of the, you know, your intro in here or your, the biography, but talk a little bit about what inspired this particular script. Sure. It was inspired by my girlfriend of eight years and she, uh, has her own birthday club, real life birthday club. So these characters are actually based on real people, except for the Hemish Sarah. She's, she's, I just made her up. But the <laughs> other ones are based on um, people from my girlfriend's birthday club. And, and my girlfriend is kind of like Cheryl. Mm. You know, she says, well, I'm not that anal retentive. You know, <laughs> she saw the, the world premiere in Los Angeles. And, and in fact, she had all of her friends who were in it come and see the, <laughs> the premiere. And uh, they they enjoyed it. Um, seeing yourself on on stage mm -hmm. played by somebody else is always kind of an interesting thing. So she's the one. I was like the designated driver in mm. uh, for her birthday club. She would oftentimes they would get a little boat um, and then take it out in New oh, Newport Beach and um, and then I would be the driver and so that oh. they could uh, have their beverages. Um, so yeah, so I witnessed a lot of these conversations and um, situations that the, the they were going through and are still going through. I still, mm. you know, they, she still has her birthday club, um, but I'm, I'm done writing the play. So I'm not going to yeah. add it. 
core to it. The so sequel, was, right? <laughs> right. That was that was the inspiration to it, really. Her birthday club and her friends and who are in the play. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. And you mentioned you mentioned Sarah. So Sarah is um like the Hemish. Like what what inspired like the Hemish religion? I loved I loved that. Well, I, I just, you know, I'd like, I grew up in Minnesota. And so mm -hmm. we'd go up to North Dakota and you'd see a lot of uh, Amish people. Mm -hmm. and so it's, it's very interesting to me to be that, that strict and, you know, that disciplined. I'm, I'm not quite that way, but um, I do respect people who are, but it is, I mean, there are a lot of funny things because the extremes, not, you know, not even being able to use a toaster or, you know, not being able use anything electric yeah um there are some extremes and i just you know there's it's satire when something mm -hmm. is there's semi-true where it kind of exists and um uh you know i it, there's humor there so that's why i love that character and because she's such a dichotomy to the other characters yes. the other ones are a little bit uh wilder or mm -hmm. at least not as you know conservative and uh, as she is and so I just love that juxtaposition of the two you know of her comments from, mm -hmm. from <laughs> that she made how did the character work in your production um she worked really yeah she it was it was really great I like how she was used how you used her in a way to kind of introduce us to the other characters and to have right. her not just as a new member but have that extra layer of that ex not I mean you know a strict religion to kind of bring out the opposite in the other ones I and the other characters I thought was just a great thing so um if people haven't seen it I I love love so I had to look like some of the words that she comes up like as what Ezra Kabesh <laughs> Ladipamites <laughs> and just some of these words um for the character was did you see her as like knowing all these words or was she searching for them like um she well I I kind of had her knowing knowing all all mm -hmm. the words I mean she um <laughs> the sayings that they would come up with kind of like the proverbs as yes you know, Moses mm -hmm. to the Israelites and so yeah. <laughs> it's her version of of that so mm -hmm. I mean they're all the words are made up and uh, yes of course. Well, my, um, my fiance is actually a pastor in town. And I had to, when I was reading this, I'm like, after the first, I'm like, wait a minute, I had to ask him, like, is this, is this real? And he's like, no. And I'm like, okay, good. That, <laughs> that, that makes more sense. Well, um, but you did a great, like, I think even our audience, some of our audience after like the first two, and then they're like, oh, okay. Okay. So I think that really enhanced the, uh, the experience for them so I wanted her to uh, you know I wanted all the characters to have like a character arc they, mm -hmm. they all start in one place and then they all change um after a number of their birthday clubs and and Sarah the the Hemish woman is the one that kind of helps them all mm -hmm. change they all kind of become different or I don't I'm not sure if I could say better people but you know because of of her influence so she mm -hmm. actually influenced all of them yeah and and I look because she again she served a great a great way with character work where playwriting can be a little bit different than screenwriting but like she served as a mirror for them as a reflection of maybe a person that maybe not like her but a person a better person that they would like to be I think yes, I think right. yeah I think that's how that uh character was done great and how it really brought it out in the end there so so a lot of fun loved doing that um so with with 19 published plays and over 600 productions worldwide, what do you believe is the key to creating a play that resonates with such a wide audience? Um, I started out not like thinking that way. I, I started out just, I just want to write a play that I, I want to do that I'm familiar with. And I didn't have any aspirations of it playing anywhere at all. I mm. just wanted it to be played in, in Los Angeles. I'm, I'm a member of a theater company here and, so I was just hoping that my theater company would do do my play. And this is 20 years ago when I start, or even longer, 26 mm -hmm. years ago. Um, so I started writing about my family 
they say write what you know. Yes. And um, I, my, I'm 100% Norwegian. My mm -hmm. dad, you know, would tell us that he was the Norwegian who loved his wife so much he almost told her. So that's what I, you know, <laughs> like, hon, tell me you love me. Mm -hmm. Oh, for crying out loud, I told you I loved you when we got married. <laughs> If anything changes, I'll let you know. And so that was my world growing up mm -hmm. very, you know, emotionally reserved. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was fun. I, I moved to New York City in, in early in my life and worked in, in Manhattan. And so I knew a lot of people from various, you know, a lot of Italian people. And so the, the Italian friends that I had were just the opposite. They were, you know, very emotional and, um, and so I was just there. I would tell them stories of my upbringing, and they thought it was hilarious. And so <laughs> just that kept with me. And so I thought I'm going to write about my family, which is a nice family gathering, is my family. And I know that that you did. The Watertown players did. Uh, the town players did, did did a nice family gathering, a nice family Christmas. And I think no, that's my family. Mm -hmm. So I started writing about my family, not thinking it would go anywhere, and they just took off they just they play you know they play all over the country and through canada and yeah England. so <laughs> and then that's when the gathering was just was an option to be made burt reynolds the the actor burt reynolds yeah he saw a nice family gathering i think in florida where he's living and he optioned it to be made into a movie so it's and then he died mm. darn him yeah but, but the director renewed the option that he had he had attached to it so it's um so yeah so i've i've been turning my plays into um into movies now but yeah so i just started writing about what i knew my family mm -hmm. and brought out the humor in that and then that resonated because i think people could relate to it and that's so i i do a lot of kind of things that i'm familiar with like birthday club i'm very familiar with mm -hmm. the world because witnessed it um, I write these Don't Hug Me musicals, which are also set in Minnesota, a little town in Minnesota, mm -hmm. and it's also about my don't. We never hugged. We always it was that arms, <laughs> yeah, pat on the shoulders kind of hug that we did. Um, yeah. So, and then um, I I decided, you know, I did this musical Don't Hug Me in in Los Angeles, which is set in Minnesota. And mm -hmm. it did very well. It ran for eight months here in Los wow. Angeles, which is a long time for something to run in Los Angeles. Yeah. And then it ran for another, my brother said, let's do it in Minneapolis. And we did it in Minneapolis. And again, it's set in a little town in Northern Minnesota called Bunyan Bay and a little bar called the Bunyan and just five characters, small character musical. Mm -hmm. So um, I, it, it, people saw it in Minneapolis and then they theaters started calling me and saying can we do this play we would like to do it in our this musical mm -hmm. can we do it in our theater and so I licensed it I just booked it myself in three or four theaters from that production and then I did something in a from a business standpoint that people seem to be impressed with <laughs> it's just a lot of work I I googled the theaters that were doing that said I want to do your don't hug me musical I googled mm -hmm. what other musicals they did and they did nonsense and forever plaid and yeah. the marvelous Wonderettes, small cast family friendly musicals and so I googled nonsense and found out all the theaters that did it and all mm -hmm. the theaters did forever plaid and marvels and i sent emails to those theaters saying theaters that have done nonsense have also done well with the don't don't hug me would you like a peru a free perusal script and a cast album so i sent out 2500 emails to theaters all around the country and 250 said yeah sure send me send me a, a script and then i and 25 of them booked so oh booked, wow and then samuel french my publisher you know, got wind of that there are all these productions. And so they published Don't Hug Me. And then they've published everything I've done since then, because I kind of have a marketing sort of background. And yeah. 
No, that's awesome. That's a great way to um, to get out there what people don't know, right? And showing the new, because we're also, I mean, Watertown, we very small um, theater and I uh, we do like kids uh, musicals, but to find something that is, you know, family friendly and, and a small cast for especially um, theaters like that, I think we, we are the norm around, you know, the country. So to have that, I think that's a, a brilliant idea. I mean, that's the small, yeah, the small cast plays and musicals is really what I, I do. I'm not, I, I hit a lot of singles. <laughs> I tell people, you know, the, the home run is, is Broadway, but I don't tend to write. I don't write for Broadway. I mm -hmm. write, for, you know, every other theater. Yeah. Between but New I York mean, Broadway. yeah. Cause Broadway is one place, right? Like <laughs> right. you have the entire country and people that, can't make it to those places or don't have access to those kind of experiences. This is all that they have. And I think, I think that's a, a really smart way of, of writing and, and capturing that for the audience and the, um, the, the actors too, because it's, it's great to have something that's different that we don't get to do all the time. Yes. Well, that's, that was my, I mean, again, I didn't plan on it going mm -hmm. into it, but it, I just kind of discovered it on the way. Mm -hmm kind of evolved very good so I know you kind of talked about writing what you know but is there anything like for for those of um, writers like screenwriters playwrights just beginning what do you believe are you know some fundamental elements they could should focus on when they're crafting their first screenplay or or play um well I think really important to have good characters that to me that's that's number one and you know I read a book called uh, rewrites I think um mm -hmm. Neil Simon and which is okay. a great book Right. Great book for anyone who wants to write a play to to read rewrites. Okay, it's, it's, not, it's not about writing; it's about rewriting. Yes, <laughs> rewrites. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I tend to start out with with characters that, if I don't know them, like I'll I'll I'll, I'll think of a character that I really like, like Tina Fey in mm -hmm. Thirty Rock. You yeah, know, just I love that character. Um, uh, you know, even, you know, I've written a bunch of screenplays. So I'm like, okay, Tom Cruise and Jack Reacher, I want that kind of character. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll take characters um, and I'll actually maybe take photos of them and put them, people, my, my Uncle Bob, really, you know, wild character kind of person. So I'll put the pictures of them on the wall and then under them, the characters that I'm writing and I'll want to, in, in whatever, however they would say it as the character that they're playing in whatever, you know, show they're on, mm -hmm. I'll try to model my character after that. So I want to have clear defined characters that are very unique and have a very unique voice that you can't take yeah. one character's line and give it to another character because it just, it wouldn't work. That character <laughs> would not say it that mm -hmm. way. So that is the most, and what Neil Simon would say is, I start with the characters and I let them tell me the story. Mm. I let my characters take me on on the journey. What what would they do now? And so I thought that was really interesting where so I tend to write an outline or you know a, a one or two page, you know, outline of basically what I want to do, but I also kind of follow that as well. I mean, I write general stuff and then it it changes because I go, you know, mm. what if this character did this and went in this direction and then of course you want to bring in conflict mm -hmm. which is important um but I do follow the you know I was a math major in college and so I'm like really kind of analytical and there is a story structure you know the first you know first act second act third act and you have the inciting incident and then mm -hmm. what happens at the end of the second act where there's no point of no return and so I kind of follow that story structure mm -hmm. um because it's just kind of more interesting i think for audiences it's more commercial if you follow that mm -hmm. story structure so i do that too there are lots of books um you know on screen i, I wrote i read a bunch of books on screenwriting before i started writing mm -hmm. plays and follow kind of the structure of, of screenplays in in my play. even though a play is generally two acts i yeah. still do three act structure in it in mm -hmm. the to act kind of according to the screenplays you want to have you know that incident in the first 15 20 minutes that yeah. sets you you know pro, yeah, yeah your, your hero off on their journey and then 
the second act is all the obstacles for them to reach their goal and mm -hmm. at the end of the second act they haven't reached it in fact they're 180 degrees from reaching it and then the third act is you know they they figure it out and they escape from the chains that they're in at the bottom of the lake and they get out and save the world so yes save the world yes well and that's what i try i try to do um i i run a, a challenge every month for new screenwriters and they have five days to write a five-page screenplay <laughs> um oh, wow. But I, I try to work with them with the same kind of arc in those five in those five pages. But some of the, you know, new screenwriters have a hard time with that because like, well, they're, you know, some of their movies don't have that or follow that. But like, there's a reason why it, it, it it's lasted as long as it has um, the three act structure and that because audience were familiar with it, learn that first and then work in ways to kind of play with that, um, with that structure. Right. It's, I mean, I, I like movies that don't follow that structure, mm -hmm. but not as well, because they're, you know, they're a little bit more artistic. Let's not follow yeah. that. And, um, I'm more invested in, in you know, following the, the character that, you know, we want them to succeed. They have mm -hmm. to climb the mountain and they fall yes. down 64 times before they finally get to the top. I want to, I want to sort of understand what they want yes. you know, in, in their story. And that's another thing. Everybody should have a want. Everybody should want something. All the characters. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's, uh, I do focus a lot on the characters when they, when they write and help them out that way too. And I absolutely agree. Have them tell the story. That's, that's where you need to start. So, um, so what were some of the initial challenges you faced when you started writing and, and how did you kind of overcome them? Like challenges and conflict in your own writing? <laughs> um, the the very first play that I wrote had um I just I really didn't kind of know. I mean I wrote um the first thing I ever wrote was was a screenplay after reading a bunch of books on how to mm -hmm. write screenplays. Um and that I wanted to get that out and I sent that out to people and it, it's very hard to, <laughs> to write a spec screenplay and get it made. So yes. <laughs> there's, a, there's a big challenge for any screenwriter to get anything made because it's so hard to do you mm -hmm. have to know people you have to yeah. if you can get somebody if you can you know get tom cruise attached all right it's made I, now i just have to know tom cruise and yeah <laughs> that's it so it's very difficult from screenplay writing to to get things made so i you know i tried to get this made and i was not having success having a producer say yeah i'll put him couple million dollars into this which mm. is a big deal so somebody goes well why don't you write a play because you can get that made mm -hmm. so I went, okay um i just wanted something up on done and so that i could that i could see so i i wrote a, a play i joined this theater company in los angeles and they have a great playwrights group oh, wow. so now i have to you know convince the artistic director to to do it so you do readings of it in front of an audience and then hopefully the artistic director will look at the audience and go, okay, yeah, this will be something that's commercial, we'll, we'll do it. And so I did four readings of my very first play and, and got comments from the audience afterwards. I always sit on the stage and I always just brutalize myself the first two or three readings that I do because the first, the first draft is generally not very good. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's okay in some respects, but there are a lot of problems with my first drafts. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening to the comments going, oh, I'm horrible. I'm just going to quit. But then you take the notes. You, you don't, uh, you know, you don't defend yourself. You just listen to all the people who are, and, and I just get notes from, from random audience members, like people I don't even know. I sit on the stage mm -hmm. and I go, what went wrong? At this point in my life, I go, what didn't work? I don't say, what did you like about it? I, no, it's just, I want to yeah. fix what's broken. Yeah. So um, I I did four readings and I made a lot, a lot of changes after each reading because you learn so much. Mm -hmm. um, and then the artistic direct. So it's it's getting it made is is a huge challenge, but, but also doing the rewrites and making sure that, you know, it's your first draft is is typical unless you're what steve kelly the guy who you know there's some writers out there that that can write a first draft and it's brilliant yep. I, I yeah can't <laughs> it, probably but um yeah so um so they 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 did it and 
they've done, I don't think, eight of my world premieres, the theater since, since then, because that was very commercially successful and did, um, did well. But now I'm, I'm a little OCD on the, the readings. I, Birthday Club, I think I did 25 Zoom readings of wow. Birthday Club with theaters all around the US and Canada. So Zoom, because it was during COVID and so, but they would, they would do the readings and sometimes in front of an audience, depending on what state they were in. And so they would put a little, you know, laptop and I could watch it and hear the audience respond. And then I would get the comments afterwards. Um, I, so the rewrites are, are getting it made, getting anything made on, you know, and, and produced is, is a big challenge. And mm -hmm. so my goal was to, make things that are commercial that that people would respond to and that would play in lots of lots of theaters and i mm -hmm. just fell into it basically i didn't i mean it wasn't again it wasn't my goal to start out i just wanted to get one production of one play and see what happened and, and it took off yeah very good and then you talked a little bit like trying that first screenplay and so rejection is obviously a common part of the writing process when you're doing, you know, anything that's performing, I guess, any writing whatsoever, but how did you handle rejection in the early days and what lessons can like new writers learn from like their rejected scripts? Um, well, yeah, that's a good, I was, I've been, I was in business for, I got started late. I wrote my first play when I was 40 years yeah. old. So um, I was in business for a bunch of years after school and I was in sales. So mm -hmm. I, I was used to, I was trained in, in, to be rejected. <laughs> um, I did fine. I did, you know, well in sales, mm -hmm. it just wasn't what I was doing. Wasn't that fun. But um, yeah. so I kind of, I was a financial advisor for 13 years as mm -hmm. I was writing plays. And then eventually I could go into the playwriting business full, full time. So I weaned myself off of, you know, you don't want to quit your day job. So, um, the, uh, yeah, so I knew rejection really well and people are really, really impressed that I got 25 productions of don't hug me by myself. That's, mm -hmm. that's but I also had 2,475 people say no. <laughs> so 2,500, you know, query sent, you know, do you want to see my, and then 25 said yes, yeah. which is a huge number. Mm -hmm. but, 2,475 said no. So, and I, you know, it just rolls off my back. It's not, it's just what it is. Um, I, if you can overcome, you know, the fear of rejection, then you can be more successful at it. Did you find like sometimes getting those rejections, did that kind of make you look at your, your work itself or did you just kind of like, you know, I know my, this is, this is good work. I've, you know, I've polished it. This is what it is. Um, did it make you doubt your work in any way? Um, no, it just, it didn't make me doubt it, but it made me realize where my world was so yeah. the Guthrie in Minnesota is a fancy regional theater in in Minneapolis, and and fancy the Geffen in Los Angeles is a fancy regional nice. They do great stuff, you know Shakespeare and you know they do um, a lot of great great stuff. But that's not me. So if they reject me, I go, I it's not your cup of tea. I, I, mm. That's I'm, you know that's that's fine you're going to do something that isn't necessarily going to be commercial, but the, the, you know, New York times critic will love it. <laughs> so <laughs> I saw, I saw a play called um, the goat or who is Sylvia. I, oh, I probably shouldn't say this out loud. Oh. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, it, it won the, a Tony award and it got mm -hmm. these great reviews. It doesn't get that many productions because it's, it's it's you know well done and well written etc but it's and the critics loved it and broadway it ran for a little while on broadway but it didn't um so there are things that that I, I, my world it doesn't work you know i just don't write for broadway i don't write yeah. for the, mm -hmm. the, the regional theaters so that's okay yeah I'm with, I'm yeah where i am 
<laughs> and that's, and that's finding too, like I said earlier, you know, you have found such a great um, medium, especially with the, you know, the Midwest and the things, and we don't, we don't get a lot of representation in other places as well. So it's great. It's great kind of seeing some of those on the, on the stage for sure. <laughs> well, I, and I appreciate that very Good. much. Yeah. And well, I Neil, saw, oh, go ahead. Neil Simon was kind of my, you know, hero. Yeah. And so I, I was actually, I started 40 years ago doing acting in community yeah. theaters. And I was in, I performed in a bunch of Neil Simon plays before I started to write plays. And it was just a, a and, but he, you know, he, he gets a lot of Broadway. He's had many Broadway yeah. productions of, of his stuff. So he's, yeah. um, but he's, he's great. And so I'm more in that world a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, and uh, because I just, uh, I, I think what he does is, is really good. What he did. Oh, was, was really yeah. Good. I've, I've been an, an actor, community theater actor for, for, oh my God, uh, almost 30 years now too. <laughs> and yeah, I've done quite a few of the Neil Simon moving from all over the place. So I've, I've done a couple of repeats as well, but I, yes, I love doing his work and I think it, it just, it, it just keeps getting refreshed. It's great bringing it to new audiences, audiences that have never seen it before, having fresh takes on it, I think. And the same with your work as well. Um, I think as it, you know, we move on, it just has such a good uh, marketability and also resonating, you know, culturally. I think that's, I think that's what makes a lasting script and that's what Neil and, and your, your plays do so well. So I think that's great. Thanks. And um, I saw on your website that you have, you're a script doctor. Yeah. I had, I did a rewrites on a few different, three different scripts that mm -hmm. um, a director, a, a guy who has directed, I don't know, a hundred different television series mm -hmm. and 40 different movies. He, I, I got to know him out here and uh, he hired me to do rewrites on three movies that he was actually going into production on and he just wanted them uh, fixed. Mm. So I did. So I, and then they got produced and uh, they did, they did well. So that would, that's great, great work being a script doctor. Yeah. <laughs> I love that work. That's, yeah. that's, that's, you know, so if you're a writer, um, you know, try to do that too. <laughs> yeah. Try to, yeah. Cause yeah, how did you, how did you balance maintaining the original vision with your creative input? Like, did you find that difficult? No, I, it's, I don't have a, a big, uh, ego as far as that goes. I'll take people's mm. stuff and then try to punch it up or, you know, make it better, or enhance characters in it, or maybe a story plot point or something, mm -hmm. bring in a little bit more conflict, or, you know, just kind of, you know, story structure elements to it that might be, be missing. But yeah, no, I, I have no problem taking other people's work. And if somebody hires me, I will absolutely. Right. Help them. Yes. Well, and that's another, I, we, I try to mention that too, like as screenwriters and I mean, playwrights as well, you, you gotta, you gotta get rid of the ego because I mean, once you write the work and you, you sell it, it's, it's no longer really mostly, I think with playwriting, it's a little different. Like uh, we got to keep, you know, the integrity of the script intact, but like with screenwriting, I mean, anything can change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had, um, I have a, I wrote a screenplay called the perfect proposal, which mm -hmm. would be considered a high concept title. The mm -hmm. perfect proposal. It's a romantic comedy about a guy that has to come up with the perfect proposal in order to win his girlfriend. And so um, I pitched that around to various people and, and I pitched it uh, to a company in Bollywood in India. So Bali, even though it's set mm -hmm. in, in the United States, um, this company in Bollywood, India said, yeah, we really like it. But this morning he sent me an email saying, would you be willing to make um, changes to it, you know, location changes and, you know, various changes so that we could adapt it to India? And I said, of course I would. Yeah. <laughs> <Of course>. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm making notes right now. <laughs> yes. Send them over. I'll yes. put them in. <laughs> Absolutely. 
So um, what are the resources I like, the rewrites you talked about the book, um, what other resources like books, uh, communities, courses, or anything would you recommend to someone just starting out in, in playwriting and screenwriting? Um, gosh, there's a screenplay book called called Screenplay. I can't remember who the author, it's the title of the book is called Screenplay. That's the first one I read. And Trudy I think I actually had, had that one. <laughs> You have that one? I think I do. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just taught me how what the, the structure was of screenplays. Mm -hmm. First act, second act, third act, what should happen in the first act. You know, the you introduce the, you know, your protagonist. And at the end of the first act, 15 pages, 20 pages into it, something happens to, to them. Um, they are challenged. They, you know, fall into a well. They have to do something, you know, something happens in their lives that changes the course of it forever and then second act they have to you know solve you know if they have to get out of the well they have to figure out how to you know mm -hmm. save the world or, or whatever and and at the end of the second act they're farther away from their goal than than ever and then the, the last act is 10 15 pages long and and then that's when it turns around and they you know save the world if you watch a movie you can i'm i'm following mm -hmm. the structure every Every movie I watch, I'm going, yep. okay. And I actually stop it. I go, you know, I see how many minutes in the first act in, mm -hmm. in, in the beginning of the second act is. And I go, okay, 18 minutes in, that's pretty, you know. And then I'll stop it when it's the end of the second act and go, how much time is left in the movie? So um, it's kind of a curse, I guess, because <laughs> you're sitting there analyzing every movie you watch. And my <laughs> girlfriend was like, gosh, would you just watch the movie instead of... <laughs> um, so... Yeah, the book, the book is in reading screenplays, you can go online and read mm -hmm. famous screenplays, you know, Butch Cassidy and the Sun, I don't know why I mentioned that, Jack Reacher, whatever is, you know, you can go online and, and get a free copy of popular screenplays yes. and read them. Mm -hmm. read, if you're a screenwriter or if you're a write plays, read plays. You, you yes. Can, you, can, you can read lots and lots of plays. And so reading is is key mm -hmm. and initially writing reading the books about how to how to write the story structure and character development and and those things are I did all of that um but but reading and then writing and then just don't be afraid to fail at writing mm -hmm. I mean I kind of I make I change you know playwrights never finish a play they just abandon it yeah. you know they just i'm done mm -hmm. uh, you know because you never neil simon came to a friend of mine directed uh is a sitcom director and he was he directed um biloxi blues i think at the pasadena playhouse and neil simon was in the audience and neil simon this was 15 years ago i think and so and he won a, a tony award for biloxi blues in 1980 or something like that on broadway so in 2006, many years later, he's watching it on uh, at a at a regional theater, the Pasadena Playhouse, and, and he comes up to my friend after the play, and he meets the actors, and they're all that that was great, and he goes, "Do you think I should change that one scene where the you know the sergeant is talking?" He's still doing rewrites on yeah. a, a Tony Award winning play. Mm -hmm. He's thinking about doing rewriting it to, yes. you know I'm like, oh my gosh so yeah don't be afraid to do rewrites and don't be afraid to get your butt kicked a little by doing readings mm -hmm. um yeah I, and i literally i did 26 i did 25 i think or readings of birthday call. i did 26 readings of my newest play love or best offer mm. and i will go to theaters for these i'll fly around to see but now I like Zoom because I can just sit here and watch it yes. on stage. <laughs> and I get comments from the audience. Just tell me what, what needs to, what didn't work? What took you out of it? What made you go, oh, no, that didn't. Because whenever you're watching something and you go, no, nah, I don't, you know, now you're out of it. Now you're, yep. you're not paying attention to the next six or eight or page. You know, you're going, that, why would, you know, you, you mm -hmm. want to answer those questions so the audience stays with the story the whole time. 
Yes. Yes. And that's even, even with screenwriting, I try to tell people like, please have your friends come over and read it out loud. Like get other, get other inputs, um, get, go to your local community theater and say, Hey, would you guys have somebody that would be willing to kind of read this for me? Some actors, you know, uh, I, I, I try to stress how important that is. And, and we all have it somewhere. I think we all, there's local community theaters all over the country. So I think that's yeah. a good resource that we writers sometimes forget about. And movies are tough. Um, <laughs> there's mm -hmm. uh, William Goldwyn, who wrote the Butch Cassidy and the Suntance mm -hmm. Kid, yeah. Princess Bride. Great screenwriter wrote a book called uh, Adventures in the Screen Trade. It's a great book <laughs> to read. He, he says, nobody knows anything. And he's he knows a lot about the business, but everyone's kind of guessing, right? Yeah. And movies, like four out of five movies fail. Mm -hmm. um, and but four out of five animated features do well. And a friend of mine has been working for Disney for 30 years. And he told me that here's what they do in with animated. They do screenings of the movie in Omaha and various parts of the, the country. And then they'll hand out cards to the audience and, and the cards will have questions. How did you like this character? What can be improved? That kind of a thing. Um, and with Toy Story, the character of Woody in the first screening was way different than the character that mm. they ended, then ended up with. Because in an animated feature, you can do these, what I call readings, but they're not readings, they're screenings. And then they get comments from the audience and then they make changes mm -hmm. to the movie based on the comments. And I think that's one of the big reasons why animated features do much better than regular because they make changes to, based yeah. on audience comments because it's easier to get a, an actor to go into a studio and and do a voiceover than it is to go to monaco and do a big action let's do this whole scene all over or yeah mm -hmm. monaco, you know and it's it's easier to do re you know rewrites and re even though it's expensive with animation it's still much easier and so i, I think because they workshop those so much more that mm -hmm. has helped them be more commercial I believe. Yes. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree. I didn't, I hadn't thought of that with the, uh, uh, with the screenings and you're right. And then you, you do show like, they do that a lot with television too, like pilots, like they, they shoot that just that one thirty minute pilot and they do, they kind of go around and have audience, um, input. So I think that's where TV has a little bit of a leg up because it's just 30 minutes instead of a two hour movie. And it's one set usually or yes, a couple usually yes now, the one or, set so <laughs> now they have more but you know it's easier to reshoot television yes. yes absolutely so for like building a portfolio for like for beginners how important do you think it would be for them to kind of build a portfolio of work and what types of scripts should they include do you think oh um the the very the very first thing i did was i I mean, well, I performed in a bunch of plays, community theater, but I got into an improv group and I wrote sketch comedy. Mm -hmm. So I came, I, I went through the groundlings mm. out here um, with Maya Rudolph was in my yeah. class. I, awesome. You know, Maya, yeah. So she was, yeah. and I wrote and performed with Maya Rudolph 25 years, when, however, <laughs> a long time ago. Uh, and she is, uh, unfortunately, I've done so much better than Mel. She is, you, you know, she is hit a home run with yeah. her career. Saturday Night Live and Bridesmaids. Mm. And everything she's done is is huge. And she's great. She's a truly talented person. But I went through the, um, you know, improv group and I wrote a bunch of sketches. Like Saturday Night Live, three mm. minutes. That's what I, the first thing I did in terms of writing. I wrote short sketches and um, perform those, but it it's good practice because it's easier to write a three mm -hmm. minute sketch than you know 90 minute play. Um, so I got a lot of practice writing short stuff. And mm -hmm. then I started writing short plays, 10 minute, 20 minute plays. So I've written a bunch of several short plays as well. Again, it's easier to get those up on, on its feet and to see what you're doing. It's very easy and, and expensive to do you know, improv where you're doing sketch comedy and just doing it in, with with friends or people that you know on, on a stage. And that way you can go, you can see where your writing is going. You can kind of see where you are in terms of what, what your skills are, what 
what you do best. And um, so that's where I started in writing short things. And then I took one of my short plays, a 10 minute play, and I turned it into a full length play. Mm. So I, I, it was good. At, you know, I was like, okay, this is, this is at a place where the audience is responding. Now I'm going to make it a full, full length feature play. And so that's how I started. And the first thing when I, 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 I wrote a short film, uh, the first thing I did in, in film was writing a short film. So writing short films is a great way to start as a screenwriter <laughs> because you can do it. it. You know, you can afford it. You can, you know, do it with your people, you know, and mm-hmm. cast it among local people. And, um, uh, a friend of mine who is just won a, a Tony, not a Tony, an Emmy award in Minnesota for a documentary that he did. He directs commercials, you know, and so, mm-hmm. com- you know, one minute commercials and, and now he's be doing documentaries and he just filmed a sitcom pilot. And so, yeah, if you start small mm-hmm. <laughs> and then work it from there, that's, that's one way. That's how I did it. Yes. <clears throat> See, <laughs> I would tell people with the, with the short screenplay challenges I run, like every month they have a new script that they have written and that they can put in the portfolio and show and, and maybe build on more. So that's, that's just been something that I've been working on. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we had exercises at the groundlings where they would say, write, you know, write a monologue mm-hmm. being somebody, you know, a friend, mm-hmm. a teacher, a coach or something. Mm -hmm. And then, but don't do exactly what they would do, but be that character and then write your own specific, you know, or another exercise was go into a a magazine and take and cut out a picture of someone you don't know from an ad, from an article, someone who's really interesting or goofy or crazy or whatever, and then be that character, you know, that you make up who, who that character is and, and write a monologue for that character. And so in terms of character development, that's one way to kind of think about it no that's that's a great exercise I haven't tried that I need to try that it's really great um so my last question here how can new screenwriters or playwrights effectively network and find collaboration opportunities in the industry there um so stage 32 there there are various websites that you can go on uh, uh, let me find it. Um, I do this one. Okay. I'm losing you here because I'm planning stage 32. <laughs> stage, so stage32.com. Okay. Go to stage32.com. That is one place that you can go to. It's not necessarily networking, but it is pitching your screenplay to producers. Okay. And um, you know, link you know, LinkedIn is is kind of all sort of business, kind mm-hmm. of not just screen. It's definitely not just screenplays, but stage stage thirty two is definitely meant for screenplays. The, the writers, you know, if you go there, you can you can go to pitch sessions, and you can actually, you know, and that's important too. If you write a screenplay, you need to have a a good pitch. Yes. Um, and you know, the elevator pitch, the, whatever the fifth 30 second, but you want to have one that's a couple minute pitch and you want an eight minute pitch. If you go to stage 32, they allow you to pitch for eight minutes. So you got to create a really, a, a great pitch for your screenplay. Another big thing in Hollywood is the pitch deck. Yes. So pitch deck. Mm-hmm. Everybody, everybody wants the pitch deck. Now your you know, your visual, mm-hmm. um, story. So you're, you're, 10 page or however many page pitch deck with with photos on it of Ryan Reynolds and you know for your main actor whatever you whoever you yeah. put for your, your your actors and here are the actors and here are situations that they get into and I did a pitch deck for uh, the perfect proposal and that has worked pretty well for me but that that apparently is really big because people yeah I don't want to read a 100 page script send me a story 10 page you know yes of it. <laughs> yeah so I, I, in a powerpoint that's usually how it yeah powerpoint 
put, mm. yeah, I put mine in, yeah, PowerPoint. I put them in PDF, um, yeah. the, take the PowerPoint, put it in PDF and then send the link to it because it's a pretty big file usually. Yeah, with all those images and everything. Wow, okay. Yeah, no, that's great. And I'll um, I'll put all that in, my, in the show notes so everybody can have the links to that if you didn't want to write it down or if you're driving, <laughs> you didn't want to write that down. I'll have the links for that in this. Well, um, thank you so much for joining me today, Phil. Thanks, Amber, for having me. Appreciate it. I'm pretty- I loved doing this interview. <laughs> now, again, all I did was really reach out to him on mess, uh, Facebook Messenger and ask if he would like to be in my podcast that I run here. And, and you know, take those chances, reach out to the, because again, we're writers, we're people. And even though they may be more accomplished or they, you've seen something, they may be above or not above, but are a little bit more uh, further advanced than where you are. You never know where that might lead. So you can catch all of his upcoming shows at his website, philolson.com. And I'm going to connect all of this in the show notes. I also have his Facebook link and his Twitter link if you want to keep in um, contact and and up to date with everything that he's doing. So that was so great. I really hope you found as much value in that as I did. And I know there are a lot of like personal stuff in there too, but just to show that... (laughs) It's just great. It, it, it's amazing to to have somebody's work and and talk with them and see their thought process because we don't always get to do that as actors or um, entertainers. So it's really great to do that when we can. So the writing action is the same um, for this month. I just, I feel like I really want you to dive into a month of creativity with my free screenwriting prompts PDF PDF that I have on my website. Perfect for both the budding and seasoned writers. This guide offers a diverse array of challenges to hone your craft from character development to gripping climaxes. I've got you covered each week. I've got you covered for five weeks, not just four, five weeks. Week one, breathe life into your characters. Week two, elevate the drama with conflict and tension. Week three, paint your world with setting and atmosphere. Week four, sharpen your dialogue and enrich relationships. Week five, tie it all together with theme and resolution. Download it now and start your journey to screenwriting success. Or, I mean, really (laughs) any kind of writing success. It's not just particular to screenwriting. You can use it for any writing that you're doing at this time. Any challenges, um, contests that you might be in that you need a little bit help of of, of sparking something. You can download it on this, uh, on the webpage, uh, scene 50, or you can get it at the scriptmistress.com forward slash screenwriting prompts. Now, feel free to share your thoughts on the Facebook page at the Ink to Screen Facebook page, or always email me at amber at the scriptmistress.com to get extra help. Now, please don't forget to sign up for the next five page short feature challenge happening in December at the scriptmistress.com forward slash ink to screen. And I just, you probably saw my face when Phil really talked about that writing and, and just getting stuff down no matter what. And I just like, yes, because that's what I really, really try to do with the ink to screen challenge. It, it's it's not about getting you guys to pay in. Really, it the, the money you guys pay go, goes back to you, really. <laughs> it, it's not something for me to line my pockets. It's really something to help you as a writer to get really, really good at your craft. And I've seen it. I've seen a lot of your writing it just improve over the months. And, and that's what brings me so much joy. So Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode. Your feedback means the world to me. If you have any podcast ideas that you think could be helpful in the future, feel free to email me at amber at the scriptmistress.com. And please don't forget to like and follow the show wherever you're listening or watching, whatever your favorite medium is that you like to catch these. Until next time, happy writing and talk to you soon.